Right, hi everybody. Uh, Robert Nels from Digital Leaders here. Welcome to uh, today's salon as part of Innovation Week. Um, you're very welcome. Just a reminder that you're being recorded, which you've probably all just been reminded of as you appeared or are joining. Uh, I know there's more people to join, but uh, I'll get on and do some housekeeping as we, we will try and finish just after four o'clock. Um, so first of all, um, can you uh, keep yourselves on mute, please, uh, during the salon? And uh, uh, you'll be unmuting yourself when we're in breakout rooms. Uh, we'll be using the chat functionality uh, a fair amount as well in terms of asking questions to our speakers. So uh, if you can just bear that in mind. So in terms of our topic, um, huge topic, sharing data in government, one we've probably all been dealing with and, and living with uh, for quite some time now. So it's great to kind of have a, a good discussion on it, uh, understand where we are post COVID, et cetera. I mean, the pandemic has, I guess, really demonstrated the power of data sharing. Uh, many of the new services that were spun up in the face of the crisis were really only possible through innovative emerging approaches uh, to ways in which data was being used as a product. Um, in this salon, we'll hear from three speakers who are practically looking to make data sharing across government work better. Uh, they are Nigel Matthews, Chief Data Officer CDO from Central Digital and Data Office CDDO at uh, the Cabinet Office, Dan Bailey, who is the CTO at the CDDO. And we also have senior developer Ben Lambert from Scott Logic. I'll come back to, uh, to them briefly, but Nigel and Dan are gonna provide an overview of CDDO's strategy for delivering on the data availability pillar of the government's national data strategy, which many of you will be aware of, uh, drawing on experience from the public and private sector. Uh, and Ben will bring sort of data as a product concept to life and distill some of the key opportunities and challenges uh, around decentralizing control of data with some of the work that he's been doing. Uh, so our agenda, we're gonna hear from our three lead discussants um, sort of without interruption. To begin with, we're going to give them all an opportunity to speak, um, put across their thoughts and ideas. Uh, then there'll be an opportunity for some questions to the three of them, uh, direct questions on what you've just heard, uh, clarifications, more detail, that sort of thing. And then we're going to head into four breakout rooms, and that's really a chance for you to speak and to hear from you and to discuss uh, what's, uh, what you've heard. And we'll set you a, a question to discuss um, and then we'll have, we'll come back into the plenary for some feedback from those rooms and then some final thoughts from our three lead discussants. So without further ado, let me hand over to Nigel Matthews and Dan Bailey. I'll just do brief, uh, brief bios for them. So Nigel, uh, I've said his role in that role. Nigel has accountability for oversight of mission three of the national data strategy, facing on transforming government's use of data to drive efficiency and improve public services. Uh, but prior to joining the public sector, Nigel held data management roles in financial services, delivering large scale transformation programs at Barclays, HSBC and ING, uh, predominantly in response to demands for regulatory compliance and digital enablement. And Dan Bailey, um, CTO, uh, alongside Math, uh, Nigel as CDO, has over 25 years experience in the IT industry, having worked across the globe in numerous industries, the thought leader in digital engagement, mobile first solutions, cloud computing, and high availability. He pioneered the UK government G Cloud program, led IBM's corporate cloud strategy, and based on practical cloud tech experience, has built numerous complex, highly available systems. Uh, so, Nigel and Dan, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks very much. We, we both actually very recently joined the uh, Cabinet Office CDDO. That's the uh, Central Digital and Data Office. Um, and I should perhaps explain that uh, that organisation leads the digital data and technology function across government, uh, working in collaboration with colleagues across public sector departments and agencies. So uh, we work very much together. Dan's actually sitting in the same room here, even though we're on a separate uh, video, uh, but we focus on delivering capability to enable departments to deliver better outcomes. So uh, that might, might include, for example, creating standards, ma managing legacy risk, improving data sharing, and uh, driving cloud adoption. 
So um, we're not going to present slides. We, we, we wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing around data sharing and, and perhaps some of the challenges that we face and perhaps some of the aspects that we find important in making sure that uh, we get uh, data sharing, uh, get data sharing right. Uh, my immediate priority is to ensure that we are collectively able to execute on the vision and ambitions of the national data strategy and in particular on mission three that focuses on cross-government initiatives including data sharing. Uh, we have five core pillars that cover the uh, management sharing and use of data so that's uh, quality availability and access, secondly standards and insurance, uh, thirdly capability leadership and culture. Okay, I will meet you on Looper Street. Okay, uh, I don't think I will be, but uh, I'll carry on. Uh, fourthly, <laughs> accountability and productivity. Uh, fifth, eth ethics and uh, public uh, trust. So clearly, data sharing is fundamental to the goals of open government. Uh, referring again to the national data strategy, and, I, I, and I've got a quote in front of me that I'll, I'll recite. It underpins public trust and promotes transparency for a fairer society with improved public uh, services. And if I have to highlight uh, a phrase in that statement that really emphasizes the critical role of data in supporting that vision, it's the phrase trust and transparency. Uh, the goals are dependent on us establishing trust in the data that we manage, the data that we share, and the data that we consume. And the benefits that we re uh, reap from uh, sharing data, regardless of the interface or the transport mechanisms, are all dependent on the trust we establish in those uh, data sets. So if I use a simple analogy, if I may, and uh, please bear with me on, on this one, imagine for a moment that you are dehydrated. Maybe you've just completed an arduous sporting event or perhaps you've trekked across an arid desert. Your body desperately needs water. You're offered a choice of two bottles. Uh, both are identical dimensions, manufactured from the same materials, and both contain a clear liquid that looks remarkably like water. One of the bottles has a simple screw top and no other discernible markings. The second bottle has a security cap and a clearly defined label. Also emblazoned on the bottom of the uh, bottle is uh, a batch number and a sell by or consume by date. Which one are you going to take? I appreciate if you're desperately dehydrated, then you're probably not going to spend too uh, long actually uh, uh, analysing the uh, dilemma. But experience tells us that the bottle with the security cap and the labelling is naturally more trustworthy. But let's assume for a moment that you have the time to review the information presented to you. Uh, the security cap tells you that the contents have been made secure. There's a high probability that the contents have not been tampered with. The label tells you that the content is spring water, for example. So that's great. The content has been classified. It's not sparkling water. It's not distilled. It's certainly not acidic or alkaline water. Next, you might identify the source. Buxton, Evian, Vidal, take your favorite brand. The source is important because we put trust in, in the source. So if the source was, I don't know, Peckham Springs bottled by Trotter's independent traders, then you might become suspicious of the source. The label also lists the trace elements recorded in the contents and the batch number and the sell by consume by dates provide reassurance that the process of sourcing and bottling the contents has been recorded and subject to quality control. All of this information constitutes meta content and it's this information that describes the content and, the, and, and is fundamental to establishing trust in the product. And of course, these same principles, as we all know, are particularly relevant to other industries like pharmaceuticals and food standards and I'd argue it's equally applicable to data as data practitioners we of course we refer to this as metadata it's all uh, it's data about data and the metadata that we collect is pretty much the same how is the data classified and described is it from an authoritative source has it been through a process of quality reassurance do we know who the owner or custodian of the data is and so taking the water analogy further, if you were to be offered data to drive a critical decision making process via one of, the, of two APIs, one with uh, the content clearly defined and the other not, which would you take? Uh, by definition, trust in open data sharing implies a mutual understanding and interpretation of that metadata. Or put it another way, metadata is the foundation of trust. And there uh, are other significant benefits, obviously, in maturing our metadata assets. We can start to use it to as a basis for search and curation of data for business intelligence and advanced analytics. It can be used alongside the underlying data content to help drive innovation through artificial intelligence. I'm not suggesting it's easy. 
it's far from it. Building metadata assets and establishing trust is something that takes a lot of time and effort. But certainly that, that's uh, my focus in my uh, first few weeks and months in my role as uh, CDO uh, in uh, the CDDO. And uh, hopefully that's given you a little bit of insight into one of the aspects of data sharing that I'm, I'll certainly be focusing on. Uh, Dan, I'm not sure if you want to add a few more comments. Yeah, no, I think I'd just like to add a little bit to that, Nigel. I mean, you cover it always so well. Um, but for, for me, one of the things that's been quite important in the roles that um, Nigel and I have taken on is the, the how symbiotic the, the data officer and the technology officer need to be. Um, and, and Nigel and I are working on a number of pan government data exchange projects, which actually is helping the teams understand the difference in the two roles. And, and I think, you know, just as Nigel's setting up the frameworks for um, understanding the metadata and how data is managed and be trusted, we're, we're also working together, kind of almost looking at the data architecture that underpins that as well. And not the data, the technical, the technical data architecture that underpins that. So what are the types of data exchanges? You know, what are the type of forecasting and, 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 and analytical systems that are there? And then how, how do they start to join up and how does that work? Because I think that's also quite an important part of actually getting data properly exchanged across government is the underlying plumbing to make that work. And so what, what you're, I think you'll start to see from some of the work that we're doing and um, is, is more, you know, reference models, standardizations and approaches to actually how we can actually create the future templates for how data is shared. You know, it, it will be the meta model, it'll be around um, where are we actually getting the data from? Are we keeping it at source? Are we moving it, moving it somewhere else to do the processing? The rules around that and then the architecture and the technical solutions that then underpin that, I think are all elements that really need to be addressed to get true data sharing at a, a government sort of level. So that's that's why you have, you have a CTO and a CDO on the call. <laughs> Brilliant, okay. Um... So our third speaker is Ben Lambert. Ben is a senior developer at Scott Logic, interested in big data and cloud technologies. Its current project is with DWP and the data and analytics department, uh, working with AWS and Apache Spark to process large volumes of data for data science, along with previous experience at the home office and other private sector clients. So kind of the other end of the spectrum, I suspect, uh, Ben. So it's good to be getting both ends of, of, of this piece. So over to you. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, and yeah, uh, so my perspective on this um, is coming from a slightly more technical uh, aspect. Um, but uh, as, as you just said, um, I'm Ben and I'm a senior developer. Um, and currently we're working on a project in the DWP data and analytics department. Um, so what I'm going to do is just give a quick overview of, of what our involvement with the DWP um, actually is. Um, and that should hopefully give you a bit of an insight into the work um, that is actually currently happening um, in the in the data sharing space sort of right now um, and some of the challenges that we're facing uh, today. Um, so to start with, um, I have a quote here from, from Simon Case, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, um, and this is from his lecture at Newcastle University, uh, which was a few weeks ago. So his lecture was primarily around uh, reflecting on the last year since his appointment, um, but he also touched on the subject of data um, and its use within different government departments. And I felt like this, this quote um, actually relates quite, really quite well to the work we're doing at the DWP. Um, specifically around the, the fact that we don't have the data where we need it. Um, so our specific area that we're looking at in the DWP is to allow data scientists um, to query data for, from multiple different departments, um, which would allow them to better assess uh, the user experience of the DWP. So the, the specific data um, that these, this da these data scientists are actually interested in um, is, is actual audit data of, of when specific events happened um, in a system, such as uh, either when a form was submitted or some action taken or something like that. So each system or department um, have their own set of services that, that users will interact with, um, and these all generate their own data. Um, the issue that we face is that all of these different systems actually generate and store their own data in isolation. 
Um, and this means that the data scientists we're working with can't look for trends and patterns across that data, um, instead needing to rely on running queries um, in each system individually, or actually in some cases, they, they don't have access to those systems at all. So to, to combat this issue, um, our goal was to present the data scientists uh, with a unified data set um, that would contain data from, from all of these different sources um, of audit events. So initially that, that work involved speaking to individual data owners um, to see how to extract that relevant data. Um, so this posed an initial challenge um, as, as data owners and their teams were uh, quite concerned about the amount of work um, that was involved for them. So they obviously have future work already planned and prioritized, um, and they maybe don't have the resources uh, to, to invest in this. Um, so actually to, for us to alleviate some of those concerns, um, we, we decided that the data owners um, would be allowed to extract uh, the data that we needed in, in sort of a way that was, was very easy for them um, and in whatever format that was easiest for them to generate which we would then accept as, as is uh, into our system. However, um, this, this comes at a cost to us um, as it means that on our side, we, we now have to deal with the issue of different data schemas and file formats um, and governance and security uh, on our side. So to help with this, uh, we're, we're using Apache Spark and Apache Spark um, is a big data engine. Uh, which allows us to sort of greatly parallelize um, the, the ingestion uh, modeling parts of our solution. Um, and then in combination with running on top of AWS, uh, we, we then have the tools to write scripts um, to perform these transformations with the sort of volumes of data that we're expecting. Um, and in our case at the moment, that, that's on the scale of millions of records per week. From that, we then take all of that output um, and save it into a single schema, um, which is then made available to data scientists to query. Uh, so by providing this single unified schema, uh, we, we actually reduce the workload of the data scientists um, in writing new queries rather than them having to go between each system um, and different tooling and things like that. But also by implementing this in the cloud, cloud uh, we gain an increase in performance by, by being able to scale up uh, the amount of nodes in our cluster that we're, that we're running, um, as well as better cost optimization. Um, so when queries or ingestion pipelines aren't running, uh, we can shut the cluster down, uh, such as at weekends or overnight. So in broader terms, um, our goal is that once the data scientists can actually view uh, that that data um, from all those data sources, they should be able to come to conclusions about um, a user's experience of the DWP, which in turn will allow the DWP to make informed decisions um, about possible changes that should be made to processes. Um, and without this data, um, decisions will, will just have to be made without all of the facts. Um, and that will mean that changes the department might decide to implement uh, might actually not be useful um, and not what's needed, uh, or even worse, could be could be the opposite of what's needed and could be detrimental um, to, the, to that user experience. So looking at some of the actual technical challenges uh, that, we've, we, that we've faced uh, over the course of the project and actually uh, are still encountering to this day uh, on the project is uh, data linking, um, security and governance, and, and a lack of data context. So linking data uh, could be very simple. Um, if there were common keys or identifiers uh, for all the information, um, which is in each event uh, that the data scientists want to look at. Um, so, so data linking is the ability to be able to identify uh, similar or the same event across, across a few different systems. Uh, however, while this is the case in some systems and we have these common IDs, uh, in others uh, where certain values might not be tracked, uh, for example, what caused a specific event, um, linking becomes either very difficult or, or impossible. Um, so for example, without a unique ID, um, could we actually identify what caused an event in one system and then see an event, see, see an event in another system and work out that they were caused by the same event? Um, 
we might be able to combine enough data um, to uniquely identify a single cause, uh, such as description and a timestamp maybe, um, but it's not guaranteed. Um, and actually, if the systems don't collect enough information, um, it, it, it is just as impossible. Another issue that we've found is uh, security and governance. And, and I guess more specifically, um, the issue is that each data owner uh, may have differing requirements and assumptions about how their data should be handled and who can view it and which parts are sensitive. Um, so for example, going back to event descriptions, uh, one data owner may actually decide that in their system, it should be classed as sensitive. Um, so would need either encrypting or hashing or, or some other uh, way of uh, obfuscating that um, before being shown to data scientists. Um, but this might not be the case for every system and a system's uh, sort of definition of what needs to be sensitive might change over time. Uh, so providing a solution that actually can incorporate these differences between the data sources and, and still continue to provide useful data to data scientists uh, really increases the complexity of that solution. Um, and, and data context was, was also something that has actually been really difficult in creating the solution. So what I mean by data context is, is knowing what a particular value um, in a field means. So for example, if I asked everyone here um, to rate the latest James Bond film uh, out of 100, we'd, we'd get a range of answers uh, for everybody here and we'd be able to work out an average and a high and low value and that sort of thing. Uh, however, without the context, to be able to say, okay, 100 out of 100 is really good um, and zero out of 100 is really bad, even if that is the assumption that everybody here made, we can't actually draw any meaningful conclusions from that data, um, it is just raw data. The on, only the people really who are working on the source system could understand what the data in their system means, which in turn means that onboarding new data um, into a data sharing platform like ours isn't, isn't just as simple as, as giving people an area to put data into and say, there you go. Um, we actually need to understand the context that would let us answer things like, is this field the same field uh, in another system, but they just have different names, for example, or if uh, this field um, is always unique so we can use it as a key, that sort of thing. Um, so on to some sort of future, future work um, that we're looking at. Uh, our, our work in the DWP, is still ongoing um, and in the short to medium term we're, we're looking to add more data sources uh, that the data scientists identify um, so they can create a fuller picture of all the events that they need to work with but but longer term things are slightly more uncertain so moving on from audit data but adding non-audit data into the schema we've created for audit data might not be possible or even if it is possible might not actually be useful if none of the data really matches up um, we could sort of add new tables for that data, um, which could be queried with the same tooling, uh, or other systems uh, could be created to do that. But with that, we we risk create we uh, we risk repeating ourselves. Um, if more systems are created in isolation for the certain subsets of data, which actually in the future we we might actually need to be linked and queried together. So. Going back to the quote from Simon Case, uh, in, in my experience um, is that yes, getting the data where it needs to be really is a challenge, uh, technically, uh, but hopefully this quick look at this project um, that we're working on with the DWP gives you a bit of an insight on, on what it's like to working to improve uh, that data sharing ability of the organization today um, and highlights the, the main benefits, but also some of the challenges of data processing and sharing. That's me. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'll let you take your slides down. Um, so, okay, so I mean, I think that probably demonstrates the sheer breadth of our topic, really, from just the, the practicalities of trying to join things up in a huge government department like DWP versus across government. But uh, now there's an opportunity we've got until we've got probably got about five, six minutes to just um, put some questions from the audience to our speakers on on what they've just been talking about and i'm going to i'm going to kick off with nigel so i mean where where do you think we are i appreciate your new interface but where do you think we are on this journey of using data to drive efficiency and improve public services and and how bullish and confident do you feel um, about delivering on that 
on that journey. And I appreciate your kind of new in new in post, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's obviously very challenging stuff. Yeah, look, I've been with um, been in my role now for about two months, so I've had an opportunity to reach out to a lot of departments, including DWP, actually, about some of the strategic initiatives that are under underway. And there's no doubt about it; there are pockets of very good. Um, uh, practice and, and good maturity there are other areas where support is required that, that that's inevitable and to be honest that that's the same for any large uh, commercial organization as well uh, I must just say actually it's interesting that you saw two pitches there that were coming at the uh, a problem from probably quite see quite different perspectives one very much from a technology uh, led position one very much from a kind of a national da data strategy strategic but isn't it interesting that we actually highlighted pretty much the same points you know the conclusion from my perspective around establishing trust and trustworthiness was all about metadata and describing the data effectively and from a technology perspective one of the hindrances one of the challenges that we face in data sharing is also you know getting real clarity around how the data is defined so you know we, we talked there about what standards do we follow do we understand the data to process it effectively it, again it comes down to defining the data uh, accurately and certainly in my experience in, in commercial sector it's um it, it's difficult it's it's a real challenge and, and organizations really sit at different levels of maturity so um you know if i look at uh, organizations like um for example, Amazon, Uber, Google, they all have a distinct advantage in this respect in that their metadata models are built by design for the for a digital economy. Organization with significantly a significant legacy infrastructure don't have that luxury and they need to harmonize their, their metadata. Uh, and that can sometimes mean taking some difficult decisions about simplifying or, or rationalizing those, those um, metadata requirements. So I, I certainly see that as being a, a, a major a challenge. There are pockets of very good practice across government, but um, there are areas where clearly we need to improve. Uh, to improve. What, um, there's clearly, a, a, I mean, I was very taken with what Ben was saying, which I think is sort of a great truth, I think we all grasp, which is, you know, data without context, data without interpretation from the creator of the data is, is very diff difficult to use. And Dan, I don't know whether you want to comment on, you know, where are we on this journey between, you know, data science, and their willingness to kind of include the data creator or the data generator in that journey because without context you know you do get into all these issues with bias and sort of you know misinterpretation yeah i think that's a very interesting question i think i think um yeah i i, I, I come back to the reason why i think it's important that nigel and i were on this call right because i think what happens is that that picture that that deck that ben took us through is kind of the journey I, i'm seeing in an awful lot of the departments create the, the answer is we, we we deal with this technically and then afterwards we find more things that are like actually we need to make some more decisions earlier on around where that content's being created and i think to be honest robin it will go back even earlier which is why having the data standards and all of that stuff that Nigel owns and runs is going to be really important. It's not just going to be about standards. It's going to be when you're in the process of doing the design of doing systems going forward and solutions, we need to really consider up front the context of that data and joined up with how we engineer that data. You know, Nigel and I were talking earlier on today about the decisions you have to make about where do you place that data and then which bits of the context of the data you need to bring up and, 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 Going even further, which is some of the other projects that we start to look at, is how do you how do you understand how much of that data we retain, and then with that data that's retained over a large period of time, what's what's the bias within that data? So I think the, the, the short the short answer is I think we have to move the dial further left, so that content and uh, metadata is really thought about much earlier on in the, in the design process. I think that's one of the things that. We, and Nigel and I are going to try and drive through a lot of the programs that government do and ask those questions much sooner. Yeah. Do you, what, what are your thoughts on, um, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the good examples of data being used are still within departments. So, you know, kind of, because at that department level, you know, within one silo, under one minister, you know, kind of that whole environment seems to be more possible to do things. Do you, is your remit, Nigel, to push beyond the bounds of 
the department and get HMRC sharing data with DWP, or that's probably a, a horror nightmare scenario. But, um, you know, sort of, are those things happening or is that the ambition? They're, they're definitely happening. They, ha they happen in, in isolated cases at the moment, and in some cases very successfully. Um, but there are now strategic programs that are underway to do that more formally. And it's interesting to note, actually, that as part of the initial proposed architectures uh, of those new data exchange frameworks, data plays a key role in metadata management, the concept of data catalogues, and knowledge hubs is absolutely fundamental to those architectures. So I, I, going back to the question you actually asked previously, am I enthused, am I confident that we will be able to deliver on this? Look, all the signs look good. We're doing the right things. And I think as Dan mentioned uh, earlier, um, you know, if we can keep the communities uh, across the CTO and CDO communities together and, and on message and, and bring everybody along at the, you know, on a level playing field, then we stand a great chance of uh, getting some really successful outcomes uh, out of this. I recently ran the inaugural CDO council uh, with uh, cross-government uh, representation. Dan has the CTO council, which will have its inaugural session very, very soon. And a core um, message that's being delivered across both those communities is data sharing and how we support uh, that those data sharing uh, framework. So I think we're doing the, the right things, but we need to build um, aspects like trustworthiness um, uh, and metadata management concepts right in at the early stages to make sure that we don't hit uh, problems further down the uh, further down the path. It's, this isn't just about throwing in a bit of technology and linking up A to B via an API. It, it, we all know it's a bit more complex than that. If we want to scale it, if it's going to be multi-party and it's going to be uh, trustworthy. And I, and I think um, we, th it's being done on many fronts, Robin, right? So th there are a number of initiatives for different ways in which data could get used. Back to thinking about very much from the beginning in terms of you know, what, what, what content is it we need? How do we need that content? And then how do we need to share it? Because there's different ways in which that data can be shared. And I would argue, at least so far, in the, the two months and three months I've been here, we found the, the right initiatives going across government, which are joining up departments to do that. Some of that's going to be incremental. Um, and, you know, some of the departments you mentioned are in, is part of that piece of work. Um, and then the way I think that will, the reason why that's incremental to answer some of the questions is, one, we will be looking at how does that data again get exposed and become open data um, and far more open, but that's part of the journey that we need to go on. And then two, if we limit it to a small number of departments, then it enables us to determine the security challenges that we're going to have um, around personal information and all that sort of stuff that's going to kind of happen along those journeys. Brilliant. Well, we should break into breakout shortly, but just before we do, Ben, What's the view, you know, what are the data scientists in DWP's view of these kind of national programs going on at cabinet office level? Are they, are they kind of positive and ambitious for the opportunities, you know, to, to share data outside of the department? I think so. And, and, and as data scientists, they, they probably just want as much data that they can get their hands on, really. Um, like that's, that's really what they're after. They want good quality uh, data that they can use to to come to conclusions at, about, um, and I guess my experience is um, sort of less cross government and more in into department um, inside the DWP. But even even in that case, um, you know they what they want in more and more data from from different departments, so they can come to different things and maybe see things from a different perspective. Um, so having the ability to have a more cross government um sort of view of of the world um would i imagine would be very very beneficial for them brilliant okay uh we're running on schedule at the moment so let's try and stick with that so we're going to break out um i think into four breakouts um so this is about you sharing your perspective about what you've heard and what you want to add to the conversation we'll be in the breakouts for sort of 15 minutes so do do some intros and then get stuck into discussing our topic uh, we have got some note takers joining us um, and they'll be feeding back what they hear in your discussion group afterwards. Uh, we do have a question for you to think about, which is where do you think the greatest challenge lies to build a data orientated public sector? Is it going to be sort of legal constraints, uh, the technology 
or perhaps sort of policy and, and, and service space. So uh, Jade uh, from Digi Leaders is going to put us into workshops. And once we're settled into those, um, do, do uh, unmute yourselves and get talking. Right, I think, Jade, I, I know you're there, you just unmute yourself. It looks like you put us into a work group here. Hopefully this isn't everyone bailing from the no, talk. That's great, okay. Yeah. Hi, Robin, sorry. Hi, Jade, so if you could move Nigel or Dan into one of the other groups. Yeah. That would be great, and bring a, and bring a note taker back into our group. Yeah, You've also got Ben in this group as well. Yes, we've managed to good old Zoom. <laughs> what are the chances? <laughs> God. <laughs> I'll try that again. Okay. Um, hi, if everybody could just join their rooms, please. They were being signed to. Um, I think we've just been bounced back into the main room. Yeah, I think we have. Is um, really got closed. Yeah, I think we've ended up back in the room, Jade. So just bear with us a minute. Sorry, two seconds. Sure. Um, Um, hi everyone, have you received an invitation to join a breakout room? No, I don't think we have. I, I did. Okay, oh, did, did you? you right. <laughs> if you did, please, could you accept it? I've not had one, no. I had one previously and then we were in it for 20 seconds and it yeah. threw us out. Um, great. If Get one of the other team members to help again. This may this may now be our group actually because I see we've now just got Nigel with us from the lead discussants and it looks like there are oh. We're on the move again. But there's 12 of us now. Have we got a note taker with us? One of the... Have we got uh, Paul, Molly or Martin? I was about to say, I can... Yeah, I can take notes. Paul, brilliant. Excellent. That's great. Okay, so... Uh, well, let's let's crack on. Let's assume that this is our work group and that we've, we've been graced with Nigel, which is fantastic. Um, so it looks like people are still dropping in and out, but not to worry. Well, I was in room four and then uh, I was put into room one with nobody else. So I'm confused. Well, you're now in a room with other people, John. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been brought back into the fold. Just really quickly, so you know who I am, you know who uh, Nigel is. Can you just very quickly say who you are? So well, let's start with Tim, Tim Johnson. Hi, yeah. So um, I'm a delivery manager at Scott Logic um, and have previously done some. Uh, financial services projects that included APIs for data sharing. So good interest there. Super. Molly? Hi, yeah, I'm Molly. I'm from Scott Logic as well. Oh, and okay. I'm in the business development team at the moment. Super. Uh, Martin G? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm uh, also from Scott Logic. Uh, oh, my role is also uh, business development, but uh, I have a specific interest in um, uh, how data is used in government, and uh, I'm very keen to uh, hear the discussion. 
and contribute uh, where I can. Ken. Uh, I work on corporate risk at Homes England, but previously I worked at DWP on the local authority data sharing project. Oh, it'd be good to hear something about that. Brilliant, Ken. Daniel? Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a business partner at Leeds City Council and I've been working on a few projects around IoT and how we share, use, safeguard the data that comes from those, those, uh, those sensors. Super. Uh, Tony? If you're there. Oh, hi, yes. Hi, my name's Tony. Uh, I work in um, a new ed tech startup as a business in business development. Uh, we're looking to work with um, the educational sector. So looking to work with the government in public schools. Um, so we're trying to get kind of like form um, connections and establish um, a channel of communication with um, our local authorities. And so I want to know um, like how the data is shared and how the kind of uh, governments kind of like communicate with each other. Yeah, and education and schools is definitely a tough area for data, I think, probably like health. Uh, yeah. Michael. Hi, uh, my name is Michael. I'm from uh, the Tactics. We're a software vendor specializing in data quality. We do supply into public sector and to governments, uh, but only currently into one um, department. So looking to just get a further understanding of relevant frameworks to be involved in in the kind of wider ecosystem. Super. John? Uh, John, okay. I'm um, data standards. I'm in, I'm in government in the uh, security community and sharing information widely across multiple organizations when everybody's got their own, own weird views of the world, how can we do that? I'm going to uh, say, let's have a common vocabulary in the middle where we simply exchange in that vocabulary and let everybody persist with their own weird views of the world. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Imran. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Imran, and I'm a, a research operations manager that works for the Department for Education. And one of the things that we're exploring is using, is looking at data sets to understand the citizens that we serve better. Brilliant, Atul, we're nearly there. If you're there, Atul, you're muted. And uh, Fian Fian Cow. No, brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much for just doing brief introduction. So I, so I guess I'll throw it open. So, John, do you? Um, We've got our question, which is where the, are the challenges going to be legal, technical or policy service driven? You're probably you've obviously been thinking about this a lot. Uh, le legal and policy side. Yes. Business change side. Yes. Technical, much less so in brief. Uh, how do you get people different or if you're sharing across different uh, silos, different uh, teams, different organisations, how do you get them to want to bother to collaborate in the first place? If they want to collaborate, yes, uh, you've got some hope, but far too often people just sit in their comfort zones. That's, that's what I see. Yeah, good opening thought. Daniel, local, we haven't really touched on local government in here. Presumably you want to make sure that local government is plugged into this so that sort of local and national data start marrying up. Yes, I think wherever possible, I suppose the biggest issue, I think John's perfectly right that we have, we have, you know, a, a regular accusation is that we work in silos within the different directorates within our, our authority. But actually, I think within those directorates, we probably work in silos from different teams to different teams. So it's, it's a dual role of convincing people to work together, both at a, almost a micro and a macro level, if that makes sense. Um, I think we also one of the one of the issues we would we could benefit from, but I don't know the answer to, is the idea that actually we will have lots of interactions with an individual across different directorates. But how do we guarantee that person is the same person? So they're if they're John Smith in leisure, but they're Jay Smith in their bins and they're GLD e. Smith in adult social care. How do we determine that actually that's the same person across the board? Because actually we we would benefit from that they would probably get a better service if we knew, could link those pieces of data together. But what we don't have is that sort of almost validation of those three people being actually one person. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And Ken, just Homes England, kind of 
I guess, tons of rich data. We all need more houses in this country. Um, yeah. Um, but we are trying to join up with a lot of other organisations because a lot of it is like banking orientated, giving out loans and grants. And so a lot of know your customer and financial background. Um, but going back to when I worked with DWP and local authorities, I think the main problem was the different systems all the local authorities had and trying to get something that could accommodate every single system that was in use. And again, the other main obstacle was everybody says, oh, data protection, can't do this, can't do that. And sometimes you think, is that just an easy answer? Just personal opinion, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure that's the case. I mean, you can... Yeah, I mean, if you say yes, you're taking a risk. If you say no, well, yeah, I guess you're not taking a risk. I guess from that perspective, you may be stopping something good happen. Imran, I imagine data is pretty full on in education. Yes, yes. I mean, with the um, pupil and teacher workforce census data returns, which happen three times a year. So there's a lot of live, valuable data, which we can use to be able to inform and understand the population that exists in um, educational settings. But like a lot of departments, there's a lot of bureaucracy. There's things that people mention regarding GDPR, the fear and the myth and the understanding with that, which needs to have clarity. But slowly but surely, the more engagement that, that I've started to do, because I'm not an expert in data science at all, but we, we can understand our landscape better by having the data which is available to us. But the more I speak to different data scientists, the better the engagement is. So we're slowly coming over that bureaucracy, but it does still remain and it's so frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've sort of rather gone around the wall just asking a few people to comment, but do other people do unmute if you want, if you've heard things or you want to add your own penneth? Um, and Nigel or Dan, if you've heard anything that you kind of want to bounce back on do you? Yeah, I'll, I'll chip, on a, uh, chip in on a couple of points there, because I think uh, lots of really good um, uh, comments made there. Uh, and I really do recognize the challenge of people uh, operating in, in silos, you know, but, but clearly there is opportunity and demand for sharing across uh, government, uh, particularly operationally and to aggregate content, obviously for um, analytical purposes as well. And obviously the ONS is a great example of, of an organisation that aggregates a huge quantity of data um, for, 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 for that purpose. The topic of data ownership actually cropped up in a question during the main plenary uh, session. And again, I see that as being part of that metadata uh, asset that we, we generate. My, my general feeling, and I'll go out on a limb here a little bit, my general feeling is, is, that, is that as a prerequisite to sharing data, there are certain data governance and control aspects that should be in place before you're, you're in a position to, to share that data. And data ownership is one of them. It's all well and good kind of sharing this data. And even if you've got a common interpretation of a data element, there are always going to be questions around uh, the quality of that data. The worst thing you could do is change the quality or change the data in response to a query on data quality in, in situ. Uh, by far, the better option is go back to the original source, go back to the original owner and request a clarification as to why the data is what it is and seek resolution at the, uh, at the source. And that's really difficult if you don't know who the owner is. So that should be part of the prerequisite for trustworthy data exchange. Do you have an owner in place? Are the custodians, is there a, a, a data quality issues management remediation uh, process in place? Now, a lot of this, like I say, take, take, takes a lot of time, but um, it's fundamental, particularly where the impact of misinterpretation of data, where you know key decisions are being made off the back of this data is, is, is key. Um, and that maybe means that we have to going forward, take more of a kind of a risk-based approach. You know, there may be certain types of data exchange, which is uh, less influenced by by those uh, controls uh, but we do need to think very seriously i think about what the minimum standards are for those highly critical uh, data exchange operational data exchanges that we uh, we do want to put in place yeah tony you you put a question into the q a before we came into the breakout rooms um which was a general which could be turned into a general question which is kind of like private sector getting access to public sector data and vice versa 
What's is there an ambition there, or do you know of some examples of it working well? Um, well, the the reason why I put that question in is is probably because that what I'm trying to do at the moment is trying to get access to um, data with schools and get access to um, you know um, to basically to money that monetize and commercialize um, that data, obviously to bring value to all parties. Um, but what I just kind of like found was um, a lot of like, for example, we, we, there are a lot of um, large companies like Amazon and Google who actually have a lot of our data. And from, for um, our companies, small startups, um, the reason why they are probably um, edging on top of us um, is because they have access to all that data. That data has become, you know, like a, a, a really strong commodity for them. So I kind of think if the government have all this data available already rather than having each kind of like startup company build up our own databases and like replicating repetition in doing all these things if we could have like just like one if there is that that data that's already available from the government if they just allow access to kind of obviously um, all these startup companies uh, we could actually compete on a on a more level playing field with like you know the likes of amazon and with google um and it will give us, you know, more chance for survival rather than, you know, obviously most startups die out within a year. But then even after about five or 10 years, we probably just get bought out or taken over rather than being able to kind of like grow any further. And which is why I think there's so many, like the largest IT or, you know, uh, computer companies are all American and there's like kind of like no British representative. And I think maybe if the date, if the date, if the government shared the data, it would without costing the government actually anything monetary, monetary wise, if they just shared this, their databases with us, we could actually, um, you know, grow in, grow our own um, digital economy. Yeah, I think, well, living the dream. Um, I mean, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because that's really saying is, is the UK sort of citizen data banks that we hold in the public sector actually a sort of an economic growth opportunity. Uh, you know, which is an interesting one, which probably bumps into the legal side and policy side of that. I mean, is there, a, I guess, but it's not a loaded question. Is there any ambition, Nigel, down in that space or, or you know, is, is law pretty clear at the moment that if you collect data, it has to be for the purpose you collect it in? And No, I think that if you read the, I mean, you can download it from uh, gov.uk. If you read the national data strategy, there are multiple strands of the data strategy and several um, mission statements. Mission three, which is the bit I'm primarily focused on, is the internal exchange of data uh, within government. But there is, I can't remember whether it's mission one or mission five, but there is a very clear uh, mission statement around government transparency. It is absolutely a, a, a pretext of, of, of the national data strategy that, uh, and, and the key support of um, key in supporting open government that we are more uh, that we improve the transparency and access to, uh, to to data. On that front, by the way, there are and and that will improve over time. You know, clearly that it needs to be done in a controlled uh, and appropriate fashion, and subject to policies and legislation and, and uh, all the rest of it. Um, but there are clear plans, obviously, to continue that work. We have already published, for example, uh, a catalogue of APIs. We are just about to release uh, AI uh, transparency uh, standards. And in time, we will start to release um, access to data catalogues uh, as well. So this is all this is all part of the uh, part of the roadmap uh, for um, general uh, transparency and uh, improved trust of uh, data, government data assets. Brilliant. OK, I think we've got about 60 seconds before we need to head back to the room. So uh, fine, do unmute yourself and sort of add your thought. I know Paul's been I've seen Paul writing furiously as as you as everyone's been talking so um do do add any unmute and add any final thoughts before we head back to the plenary where we'll be getting some feedback from the other groups uh, and some final thoughts so if there are the Jay, do you want to, sorry, if someone wants to speak. Robin, I was just going to say, I know there's a few other questions that come up in the sidebar. Is, is there any chance of capturing those? I'm more than happy to uh, take those and re, um, provide uh, responses uh, subsequent to the event. 
Yep, I'm, uh, I'll double check when we're back in the plenary whether we can capture all of that, but I'm sure we can. Jay, do you want to bring us back to plenary, please? Yes, I'm just going back now. Brilliant, thank you. Fingers crossed for a similarly smooth journey. Fifteen seconds. Fifteen seconds, great. Thank you. Great, Jade, let us know when we're back. That's, that, that's we're everybody. Back. Okay, super, brilliant. So let's get, some, let's get some feedback from the rooms. And because Paul was with us, I'll ask him to feedback first. So over to Paul Dykes from Scott Logic. Hey, thank you. So yeah, we had a, a very good wide ranging uh, discussion on this. And I think just to summarize the main points. Um, uh, so there was the, there was the point that the sort of, I guess, the human or the collaboration side of this is the more challenging aspect. Uh, it's around the sort of the government side, the um, the the legal side, the business change, the sort of transformation side of things. Um, with the feeling that the tech challenges are potentially more solvable, although they're still not exactly uh, small. I mean, there there is the kind of issue of, as we've talked about, uh, heard about throughout the event about the uh, sort of being able to tell that the same to identify the same person across different departments, different directorates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then in terms of uh, the legal side of things, there's sort of clearly need for evolution there because uh, one person uh, commented on the fact that things like data protection, how do they, you know, does that give people an easy get out of jail free card if they <laughs> don't want to get involved in these transformation um, uh, initiatives? Um, Ownership, obviously, we've heard, you know, really big issue here and actually fundamental uh, to get the governance and standards set up first for this, uh, especially if, you know, this data is going to be used to drive important decision making, you need to be sure that it's that it's good quality data and uh, that, that's, that it's the correct, that it's correct data. Um, and we ended on the uh, topic of what the potential is for um, this public data, the citizen data to be, uh, or any, well, for data within government to be accessed for by uh, the commercial sector in order to sort of find ways to monetize it and drive uh, drive business and innovation in the economy. Um, and Nigel mentioned that uh, that is actually a key part of the national data strategy, um, uh, that obviously it's, it's, it'll take time and it's, it's complicated, but there is absolutely uh, the will to make that possible. Um, I think that covers the main, the main things we discussed. Brilliant, thank you. Now, um, there was a second room, but I'm not sure whether any of the team were, anyone was capturing notes in the other room. So I'll just, if anyone was note taking the other room and they're back in the plenary, do, do, shout now otherwise i'm conscious of time we've got about three minutes left so i think i'm going to use those three minutes to invite our lead discussants to just make final comments really on today's event and some of the things i've heard i'm going to do it in reverse order so uh, i'll start with ben so ben final thoughts yeah um it's been very nice uh, to, to speak to you all today um and uh, to talk to the guys that were at least in my group um, from their different perspectives um, around what the sort of challenges are um, with with data sharing um, that hopefully we can then take forward um, to to improve uh, data sharing across government uh, in the future. Um, I'd also like to say at this point thanks to, to Rob and Jade and everybody else at Digital Leaders for, for organising this event. Um, it's been been very useful. So thank you. Yes, that's, that's very kind. Uh, Dan Bailey. So 
So I think. Oh, now we can't hear either of you now. <laughs> Give everybody, right? Which I think, having come in back into government, that there is a massive desire and hunger for the right data to be to make informed decisions and to make citizens' experience better than. And, and there's a real focus on it. And I think that's going to help cut through. Now, the scope is still massive and the problem space is still humongous. But actually, the desire to make the change is really, really high. And I think there's a real opportunity for all of us to really get some proper value out of the data sets that government has uh, and exchange it better. And so it's quite, I think it's an exciting time. And whilst I know it's hard, we've all been here several times before, it's, we're at the, I think we're at the top of a wave to explore that. Brilliant. Thank you. And the last word to Nigel. Yeah, look, I share Dan's uh, optimism uh, Optimism here. Um, it is difficult, and particularly on the scale of, uh, you know, public services and, and, and government, uh, it is a huge challenge. But I genuinely believe that if we build for that kind of future vision, but build in, in kind of incremental steps, we will we will get there. The worst thing we can do is build, obviously, on what we know today with very, very simple technical paradigms for, 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 for sharing uh, data because we'll fall into, uh, you know, similar traps as we've uh, for all fallen into in, in uh, previously. But I think if we start thinking about what, you know, multi-party trustworthy data sharing is all about, then we will do the right thing to uh, uh, travel along that uh, path uh, towards that vision that we all uh, are all looking to achieve. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Well, I mean, it's a huge opportunity um, for UK PLC, UK government, uh, for UK citizens, I think, to get this right. So it's really great that it's at the forefront of people's thinking. And through the Cabinet Office, we've now got a sort of really dedicated team to delivering it. So thank you to our three speakers. Uh, thank you to, to Paul for, for noting the discussion and feeding back to us uh, after the breakouts. And thank you to our partner, Scott Logic, for um, sort of suggesting this topic and making it part of Innovation Week. And we will uh, share this recording with everybody who's uh, registered today. And I've asked my colleagues to capture the Q&A, Nigel, and we'll get that across to yourself and uh, Dan and Ben after the talk. But uh, I declare the event closed. Thank you very much indeed for all coming. Thank you. Thanks.